Hollywood, you know. <laughs> Good afternoon, comrades. Well, we're doing this session only in English. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Dan Galeen, um, a man who I hope needs no introduction at a global solidarity conference. Uh, Dan is here today to launch our new Labor Start book, a collection of his essays. When we were thinking about what to call the book, I reread it and tried to find a common theme, uh, a word that repeats itself throughout the book and throughout Dan's extraordinary life. And the word that came to mind, the title that came to mind was this one, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at least, at least Dan left at the joke. No, solidarity. Solidarity is the, is the word. So that's what we called the book, Solidarity. We've launched it at a global solidarity conference in which the theme is global crisis, global solidarity. So in the world of marketing, you'd call that branding. Dan will speak for a few minutes about the book uh, and about the labor movement, about his own experiences. He'll be followed by uh, Lisa Merliak, from the Independent Miners Union in Belarus. And after that, and they're both very short speeches, uh, and after that, uh, we'll open the floor to your questions and comments and discussion. And when the session is over, Dan will sign copies of the book, which you can purchase for nine euros from us, or, or 10 if you really like us. <laughs> so, Dan. OK. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, and uh, uh, thanks, Labor Start and Eric, for this uh, occasion for this opportunity. When Eric first mentioned the uh, plans of, of publishing such a book, it came as a surprise to me. And it is an honor. And Eric did a brilliant editing job, so I'm very grateful. Uh, we, we are meeting in the Kotucholsky room of Verdi. Uh, uh, Kotucholsky was a brilliant uh, left socialist, journalist, writer, poet in the 20s and 30s. And uh, he's, in one of his uh, prose poems, he has a, a sentence of, what is it that social democrats are proud of? And the answer is to have prevented worse from happening. Uh, so anyway, that's, that was too hasty. Uh Back to the book. The, 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 the book spans several decades, uh, most of my life. Uh, I uh, started to be politically active in the early 50s as a student in the United States uh, at, where I discovered socialism in the form of a uh, dissident Trotskyist tendency in the, in the midst of the McCarthy period. And uh, we, we called ourselves independent socialists. Uh, the Stalinists and social, Demo social Democrats called us Trotskyites. The Trotskyists called us centrists, and the government thought we were some sort of communists and had us uh, on their subversive <coughs> list. I attracted the attention of the authorities, and in 1953 I was given one month to leave the country. So I returned to Switzerland from where I'd come, and uh, eventually I, I joined the Swiss Socialist Party. Uh, I'm still there. I had no interest in a political career. Uh, even in the socialist movement, and I wanted to be where the workers were in the trade union movement. So when I heard that the then general secretary of the IUF uh, <coughs> was looking for an assistant, uh, I jumped at it and I started working at the IUF in August 1960. My job uh, was everything. I was chief cook and bottle washer. Uh, I had no idea or expectation of ever being uh, the coming general secretary of that organization. Uh, but I eventually did. Uh, that surprised many, including myself. Uh, and it's a complicated story that I will not bore you with now. Uh, it's in the book, anyway. Um, so, in 1968, the IUF executive, uh, appointed me as acting general secretary under the supervision of a president uh, who was supposed to control me to make sure that I did not shift the organization in too radical a direction. Uh, two years later, 
the Weber Union thought they could take the risk and uh, I was properly elected at the, at the Congress. I retired as IOF General Secretary in April 1997 and together with others I founded the Global Labour Institute. Now, I had spent 37 years of my life in the IOF, of which uh, 29 years as General Secretary. And uh, that is a long time and I want to uh, tell you now why I did it and, and what I was trying to do. The first issue is, what is the point of the International Trade Union? <coughs> uh, when I started in the IOF, uh, it was mostly a contact point as an information exchange uh, of member unions and of members of their governing bodies, like most international trade union federations at that time. Uh, my predecessor, Jule Paulsen, uh, a solid Danish social democrat, uh, thought we could do more. Uh, he, he did not share the complacency to, uh, of the post-war social compromise, and of course I welcomed those, uh, that train of thought. My hero was Edo Finman. Edo Finman was the General Secretary of the International Transport Workers Federation from 1919 to 1942. He advocated an international trade union movement based on the ind industrial federations. He saw the darkness coming and uh, as a revolutionary socialist, he thought that the movement uh, that had its act together and was organized for class war could stop capitalism in its tracks, uh, including its fascist shock troops. Uh, for a time, he tried to achieve unity between the socialist and communist trade union movements, but after the Spanish Civil War, he gave up. He understood that no compromise was possible with Stalinism. Uh, so in the 1960s, we had to ask ourselves, uh, was the class struggle over? Hardly. Uh, do we have social partners? Uh, not really. Uh, what we had was social counterparts, and that's what we have today, it's not the same thing. Did we have real enemies? Yes, of course, uh, all over the world. Our members were facing brutal employers with governments at their service. So, re we, in reality, we were in a class war. We were in a war in, in which many had thought they had left behind, and the task was, uh, therefore, to organize for war to turn a letterbox organization into a combat organization, uh, to make it fit to take major battles and, uh, and win. So that's what I started doing when I became General Secretary. It was a long process, but every battle won, and uh, even those we lost made it easier to win the next one. And that's how we beat Nestle and Coca-Cola and some others. Uh, <coughs> You, you heard some of that this morning, and even became partners with some decent employers. We were credible and could do that because we had become strong. I have now been out of the IUF for 17 years, and my successor, Ron Oswald, picked up where I le left off. Uh, and I, I have to say that it's an immense satisfaction for me that the IUF has developed into an even better combat organization, more efficient, more focused, and able to take on much bigger challenges than, than, than in my time. I'm proud of the IOF. It is a, a beacon of true trade union values, democracy and militancy, and uh, I just wish there were more such organizations. The second issue, the second issue is independence. In order to do all of this, we had to defend the independence of our movement at every step. Most of these battles had to take place within the trade union movement itself. In the decades following the war, uh, I'm sure you are aware, the trade union movement was a target of many political takeover <coughs> operations, mostly operating from the leading powers of the Cold War, the United States and the <coughs> USSR, as well as some smaller governments uh, who wanted to control the unions in their, in their own countries. 
and we, we fought and defeated all of them. <coughs> the CIA tried to infiltrate us in Latin America. We threw them out in 1965, and they didn't come back. Uh, in 1981, the Singapore government put pressure on our Asia Pacific Secretariat, which, which was in Singapore, uh, <coughs> to stop what they saw as our overzealous defense of trade union rights in, in Asia. Uh, so we closed the office and moved it to Australia uh, and continued to defend trade union rights as we had always done. Then after the ETUC was established in 1983, no, sorry, 1973, of course, 1973, some of our European affiliates uh, got the idea that Europe was the only region that actually mattered and tried to set up an independent organization. Uh, most of our affiliates, even in Europe, disagreed. And we had seven years of European turmoil uh, until nobody questioned that our European regional organization was indeed part of the international. That much the same happened in the ITF and the transport workers. The, the communists had their own international, the WFTU, World Federation of Trade Unions, still there. Uh, which never got any traction because it was dominated by state-controlled unions, so-called unions of the Soviet bloc. For us, state-controlled unions were yellow unions. Uh, they could never be partners or allies in any form. And our, in our jurisdiction, we cut them down to size. Although we did save one of the cadres out of Chile from certain death during the Pinochet Putsch. The Catholics also had their own organization. They were never any serious competition, and eventually they joined us, actually much before the ICFTU uh, WCL merger. So by the 1980s, every conceivable political tendency was represented in the IUF. Uh, around a large social democratic and socialist core, uh, we had conservative syndicalists, the FFCIO, <coughs> We had communists, Trotskyists, Maoists, Christian Democrats, Peronists in Argentina, uh, a variety of moralist, radical, national liberation movements. Um, so how did we hold all of this together? Uh, by running the IOF like a political party, the, the, in its own right, the Union Party. The principle was everyone in the IOF was free to hold whatever political views they wanted, but not to try to impose those views on the organization. Uh, in any event, the union, that is the IOF, had to come first. And if the IOF had any ideology, uh, any, uh, any common denominator, uh, it was to organize workers as a class. And in independent and democratic organizations, in order to win our battles. In a perspective of class struggle, although we hardly ever used the word that the general stayed away from the jargon. We just did it. So everyone eventually accepted this. The union had to come first. This may sound like syndicalism to you, uh, and in actual fact it is. In the 1970s, one of my old American comrades accused me of syndicalist deviation, and uh, I think he was right. Uh, with time passing, I, I believe uh, even more now that the revolutionary syndicalist movement of the last century had many lessons for us uh, that were too soon forgotten. Uh, its fierce spirit of independence, uh, the importance of direct action on the job, <laughs> the experience of irreverence, uh, its contempt for exaggerated legalism, uh, and its spirit of sacrifice. So w when I look at what has happened today, <coughs> like for example the, the international campaign against the fast food, fast food chains, uh, the militant struggles to uh, try to create a trade union movement worthy of its name in China, uh, in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine, Belarus, Russia itself, I see that uh, this spirit is alive and it warms my heart. A third major issue is democracy. 
<coughs> democracy is not some sort of promised land, a, st a state of being. It is a method uh, and it is a process. Uh, it, this process is never ending. Democracy is always a work in progress. You could say the same thing about socialism, actually, uh, and even about revolution, but, but I digress. For an international organization like the IOF, uh, any, any international trade union federation, democracy is a serious problem because we are several steps removed uh, from the workplaces where our members are. Uh, <coughs> Our structures are those of representative democracy. Formally, our members are national unions. Our office holders are responsible to governing bodies, the administrative and executive committees, and ultimately the Congress. Now, all too easily, such structures can become strongholds of bureaucracy, uh, the enemy within the labor movement and the resting place of self-important and complacent leaderships, always finding the reasons why something cannot be done, or opposing everything they have not thought of first, and believing that nothing must ever happen for the first time. And especially that they have some sort of right to be there forever. Now, the only way to escape this is to accept risks. Uh, what you have to do as a leader is to never confuse the authority <coughs> that you exercise by virtue of your position and to the best of case because of the quality of your work with a source of authoritarianism. Uh, your office makes you nothing more than a foot soldier <coughs> in a great cause and it gives you no rights except that of treating your members with the utmost respect. Your responsibility is to educate your governing bodies in all modesty to the seriousness of the issues and to exercise themselves the authority to which they have been elected, even at your own expense. By the 1970s, the IUF was beginning to have governing bodies with a growing self-confidence, with adequate information, and with a deep understanding of the responsibility of the issues. They were beginning to give me a hard time. This was not always pleasant, but I was able to tell myself that I had been successful. The IOF had a democratic leadership. Another aspect of the democracy issue often overlooked is the gender issue. The trade union movement has been traditionally male dominated, and it still is. Accepting this is to accept that we will never represent more than half of the world's working class. And worse, it also means that we will never challenge the patriarchal structure of our society, which is the ultimate source of its authoritarian structure at work and everywhere else. The IUF membership always had an important component of women workers in food canning and tobacco processing and in the catering services, but its governing bodies for a long time were nearly always exclusively composed of men. Yet it was these governing bodies which in 1983 unanimously decided to accept the Self-Employed Women's Association of India, SEWA, into affiliation against the opposition of other Indian unions uh, who claimed that SEWA uh, was not a real union but an NGO and argued that it should not be accepted because it was discriminating against men. Today, SEWA has one and a half million members. It is the largest women workers organization in the world. And more importantly, it became the driving force behind the International Women's Network, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing, WIGO, with the objective of organizing women workers into, uh, in an informal economy everywhere into unions. And at this point, I want to say something about the Global Labor Institute, the GLI. When I retired from the IUF in 1997, I, together with others, founded the GLI as a platform to fight for union renewal in a socialist perspective. Basically, it enabled me to continue doing what I had been doing for 40 years, together with my comrades of many years, uh, Dave Spooner in particular, whom some of you might know, who created another GLI in Manchester. 
One of our first activities was work with WIGO, the organization I just mentioned, to inf organize informal women workers, and our focus quickly became domestic workers. A workforce of several million, nearly invisible, hardly ever perceived to be women uh, workers by trade union movement or by anybody else. The IUF affiliated to WIGO and together uh, with the GLI assisted domestic workers union over four years to create an international federation. And it's meeting right next door, in the room next door. So in November last year, the International Federation of Domestic Workers held its founding congress in, in Montevideo. That was an extraordinary experience. Hundreds of women, domestic workers, emerging from virtual serfdom, embracing their dignity as workers, enthusiastically learning at the congress itself how to organize internationally, how to write and adopt a constitution, creating the first international trade union federation in history entirely run by women. The federation is now affiliated to the IUF as an autonomous group, and it, it has become unstoppable. It is the biggest labor success story of, of last year. But the GLI is more than that. We are now an international network. Besides the GLI in Geneva and in Montevideo, uh, in, <laughs> in Manchester, of course, there is a GLI in, in, in New York uh, at Cornell University, uh, which is doing pioneering work on uh, how you, trade unions should approach environmental issues. Uh, there is Center Praxis in Moscow, uh, which is organizing conferences to bring together the independent left and the democratic trade union movement in the successor countries of the USSR. And, uh, as well as editing socialist literature, which was unavailable to Russian readers uh, during the entire period of Stalinism. Together, we are trying to revive the principles of the labor movement, so people remember the original purpose of the exercise, to revive the knowledge and understanding of history, because history is about identity, and therefore not about the past, but about the future. And on behalf of the network, the GLI Manchester is running an annual international summer school in July, which some of you may know about and have attended. The theme is always the politics of the international trade union movement, what they are and what they should be. So each, each GLI is autonomous, but we work together as a network. Others may join. We are in the process of creating an invisible international. It is growing from below within the shell of the old, how far we can go the future will tell. That's what I wanted to tell you about what I did together with many other good comrades. Did I make any mistakes? Of course I did, many. I was hopeless as an administrator. I made misjudgments about people, uh, being too generous to some and not enough to others. Sometimes I was betrayed and found myself disarmed. However, I had grown a thick skin over time, and fortunately, with good luck and uh, with the help of good people, good friends, my mistakes didn't seriously damage the organizations that I had responsibility for. Uh, one last word. Uh, we are in for the long haul. Never forget that. I believe that uh, none of us, even uh, those much younger than me, uh, we live to see the world we're fighting for. But as the Mishnah says, it's not up to you to finish the work, and you're not free to stop doing it. Uh, all any of us can do is the best we can where we are, while we are there. And sometimes when I talk with young comrades, uh, <coughs> I tell them you're likely to live uh, 50 or 60 more productive years. That's how long you have to last. Pace yourselves, stay healthy, <coughs> take it easy but take it. <laughs> Thank you.